Hey, John Tai here, and welcome to the Self Publishing Summit. Our guest today is one of the most successful Kindle authors of all time. By early 2014, he was averaging $20,000 a month in royalties. And in May 2014, he hit a high of $60,000 royalties in a single month. He's also been ranked as the number one business author on Amazon multiple times, and every single one of his books is self published. Uh, today, he's going to be sharing with us some of the advanced book marketing strategies that are working for him now. Our guest today, Steve Scott. Steve, welcome to the Self Publishing Summit. Hey, John. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you here, Steve. So, oops, I'm having a little tr trouble with the cameras there, so we've got that sorted out. So, <laughs> great to have you here. I've given that uh, intro there. Why don't you kick things off by just giving us an overview of your illustrious Kindle publishing career? I think it'd be great for people to know a little bit more about uh, what you've been doing. Illustrious makes me sound important. Um, yeah, I got um, I got into Kindle publishing. I, I've I've told the story many times, so hopefully I won't bore the people who've heard it before. But <laughs> I've uh, I got into Kindle publishing back in February 2012, and as kind of the anecdote that I like to give is I got into it more as a traffic generation strategy instead of an actual income strategy. So I fumbled around. I would say within the first five six months, I really didn't do much with it. I just took a couple of old uh, pieces of content and put it into book form, which is, uh, in my opinion, a pretty terrible strategy, but that's kind of what I did when I first got started. And that the, the first couple of months, like I said, didn't really do too much. And in the summer of 2012, I took the first book and put it through KDP Select, which I'm sure people talk extensively about. Uh, but with KDP Select, I just gave away for free for five days. And as soon as it went back up to paid, I noticed it actually started generating some decent income anywhere from seven to fifteen dollars a day so i, I was th sitting there thinking like wow this is actually something that i could see the seeds of a business that could lead itself to instead of blogging i could actually sit down and write short actual kindle books so that's kind of what i started doing in september 2012 and I, I really did that pretty pretty much full time for about a year and in, i would say in early september two, or early 2013 I kind of switched over into writing about habit books and I tried a couple of other things, but eventually I just kind of went into the habits market, more personal development. And I pretty much did mm -hmm. that full time since the summer of 2013. And really it just, it seems I've been working ever since then. I really kind of, mm -hmm. um, I've been kind of iterating, trying to prove upon uh, the different things I've been doing since then. But kind of the short end of it is I've done about 50 some odd total books. It's, uh, and that's hard and really kind of learned a lot and hopefully, uh, throughout this presentation, I can share some of what I learned along the way. Yeah, so I mean, fifty books—that's that's great. I think um, I know that at one point in time, you were bringing in a book out pretty much every single month. I th it, am I right in thinking that you don't bring them out quite as often now? Yeah, I, I definitely at the time actually. Not, I've almost gone circ circular where I've gone back to the idea that maybe the shorter books are uh, the better strategy, but for Lately, I would say for the last six, seven months, I've really tried with longer books, so books anywhere from 30 to 35,000 words. So pretty for a Kindle-sized book, it's a pretty extensive book. It's I kind of always looked at Kindle books as that middle ground between a, a really long blog post and a full-length book somewhere in the middle that really just focuses in on one topic. But I've tried the model of just really writing really lengthy uh, books, but I don't really see the difference in actual sales and long-term um, results mm -hmm. for those books. So I'm kind of getting back into the 20-ish thousand type of uh, word. So to answer, I used to do a book every three to four weeks, and now it's taken me everywhere from six to eight weeks. So hopefully I'm trying to get back into <laughs> somewhere in that middle ground. Yeah, so that's interesting. It's like you make that point, it's sort of somewhere between a long blog post and, and a book and, you know, 20... I guess sort of 20, 25,000 words being the sweet spot in terms of, uh, and also spending enough time on it to, so that it's quality content. I think that's a very key thing. I, I don't want people to come away with the impression that, uh, you know, the way to succeed is to just throw stuff out there, which yeah. I know some people teach. I know you don't teach that. I don't teach that. No. <laughs> but it's a really important point to make. The stuff that you create is is quality, but they're relatively short books, which allows you to get them out in a short, uh, you know, quite quickly or in, in these three weeks, six weeks eight weeks that's that's still quick <laughs> especially when you look at a traditional publishing model uh, oh yeah definitely. Quality content. yeah some of the traditionally published books take anywhere upwards of uh, a year to a year and a half to even get out to the marketplace so oh, i, I to, to keep with the uh, to like production schedule i really try to focus in on pretty consistent content and actually having schedules and uh checklists and all all, all sorts of stuff like that 
Okay. And uh, last time we spoke, you were saying that you, you sort of do a, you did a four day week and then you had a, I think you took Fridays off if I remember right. Uh, is that still the case? You're still doing that four day week? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I still try to take, um, it's, it's gotten now it's every other week, but I do try to spend, um, a couple of days with my family. So my, my parents and my brother. So what I used to do, uh, which I still kind of do, but I do it every other week now, but I would go down, visit them for a couple of days and take Friday off and go see a movie and st stuff like that, where I, I do try to do stuff where I'm not always working, but I would say it's now four days, sometimes five days a week, but I really do try to take full days off where I'm not always uh, working, which I know a lot of writers really believe in the, the, the power of actually writing every single day. I just find that having a couple of days off helps me kind of uh, rest and recover and kind of prepare a week ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of with you on that. I, I do like the idea of being consistent because I think if you're consistent in your writing and not leaving big gaps, you know, stuff gets done. Uh, you know, you, you make that progress. But I also believe that you do need to take some downtime, you know, a couple of days off here and there, which I'm not always that good at doing. <laughs> I'm getting better. But, I, you know, that downtime allows you to recharge both physically and mentally and come back fresh and be ultimately more productive. So I think, you know, that's that's definitely the way to go. So interesting so okay so you got 50 books out and uh you know going back i mean gosh going back three years or so since you first started uh publishing on kindle you know we're going to talk today about advanced book marketing strategies the sort of things that are working for you now and it's going to be a bit of a sort of free flow conversation i don't know what you're going to talk about so um <laughs> Why don't I hand it over to you and, uh, you know, tell us about some of the things that you're trying, that you're getting good results with and, uh, and are working for you now. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm not entirely 100% sure that this is actually going to work, but I've really been testing a lot of Facebook ads, uh, Facebook advertisements. Mm. Um, and I've really, I, I actually, the one person that's a pretty good resource is uh, Mark Dawson out of selfpublishingformula.com. He actually has a three-part video series that kind of goes over his technique. So I'm, I'm kind of paying attention to what he's doing. He seems to really have figured out the Facebook advertising side of things. And I would say where, where our strategies are differ is I'm really, a, I still am a firm believer in kind of the idea of building up a Facebook page. And one of the disadvantages that people uh, talk about now with Facebook is organic reach is dead. You can't necessarily reach a lot of people with Facebook advertisements, but mm -hmm. I find that if you have consistent free content, so I have a lot of slide shares with my business, a lot of uh, different promotions like 99 cent deals, free books. Like I have a lot going on that I know with Facebook, I can consistently post on the Facebook page. And yes, I'm not hitting a lot of people at the same time, but I know that they're seeing I'm consistently providing free content. And the one advan another advantage of a Facebook page is you can actually run advertisements to the people who like your Facebook page. So they see that you're consistently providing free content. They know who you are. So Every time you come out with a special deal or free book or 99 cent promotion or whatnot, you can run ads directly to them and they, they already know you. So the conversion rate is a lot higher than you would get just by running advertisements to uh, so-and-so who likes this page. It's people who are already aware of your uh, stuff. So that's, um, and I guess uh, if you want to talk about that or I can talk about a couple other things I'm testing. Yeah, now. well, uh, you know, let's... Um Let's dig into that a little bit and, and, and okay. tell us, you know, what it is you do and, and, and what your, your purpose is behind that. And, and, but just before we do, I just want to sort of flip that around because I know, and I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but there's also data that kind of goes the other way, which is that you know, you're saying that if you have the free stuff on your Facebook page, um, people are more likely to uh, click on the ads, which is true. Also, if you have good social interaction, when you send out emails, and yeah. uh, that's another important part of it, people are more likely, because they're familiar with you from, from social, they're more likely to open those emails and act on those as well. So it's a, a double advantage there, yeah. and it works both ways, which is nice. So yeah, uh, dig into that strategy a little bit more for us. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a couple things I do. Uh, first off, um, kind of a little bit of what you touched upon is like, I still am a firm believer in email marketing and I think email marketing should be a focal point for any business. And mm. that's kind of why we talk about advanced strategy because this is not, this is in my opinion, secondary, not maybe tertiary, like third, second or third below an email list. So mm. we can definitely talk more about email lists later, but I find that when someone joins your email list, if you get them to join your Facebook page as well. So they join your email list, they come to a thank you page. And what I like to do is promote, here's one Kindle book you can get at 99 cents or check this Kindle book out. And right below that is go come join my Facebook page because I give away free offers. So mm. on my Facebook page itself is I have a free audio book where 
uh, actually pinned to the top of it. So there's an actual incentive to go check out the Facebook page. They see the link to an audio book and hopefully they'll go on to like the page. And I find that if they're both on my email list and my Facebook page, it's like multiple touch points. And, and also you do build a little bit of that um, kind of back and forth interaction that you would get with a reader of what you don't necessarily get with an email list. It's more of a kind of personalized, yeah. like, here's what's going on. And to be honest, I don't do it as good of a job with my Facebook page as I should, but I am putting plans into it. That, and I also, I, I've been trying to run like campaigns as far as targeting different uh, people. Uh, that's the, this person likes this author, this person likes this brand, and try to get them to like my Facebook page. I really haven't seen an ROI on that, but for me, I'm kind of willing to invest about five hundred to a thousand dollars a month just playing around with uh, Facebook ads, as just trying to build that up. Um, but beyond that, it's really just, for me, it's just a kind of a learning process, and it's definitely something I'm testing. I don't. I'm, I think probably at this point, I might be even still losing money. But for me, it, it's really it's really a matter of actually having multiple touch points where you talk to people, not necessarily just relying relying solely on your email list. Yeah, I just want to touch on something you know i think there's a, a real learning point here that goes beyond just the you know the mechanics of you know a facebook page and how to get people onto that and, and giving away the free audio but which is all great but the fact that you know even now with your level of success you're still trying new things and yeah. crucially you're testing things so you know the big takeaway if you're listening to this is you know don't be afraid to try new things put some money into it if it if necessary in order to get a result if it doesn't work you might be able to tweak it and prove it you know if it, if you really can't get it to work move on and try something else but you know if steve with his level of success <laughs> is still going out and testing stuff and trying new things um but the testing thing and the monitoring the results that is absolutely key because unless you do that you really have no idea whether you want to invest both your time and your money into a particular marketing strategy or tactic so yeah exactly yeah, really important yeah and so what, what else have you got for us, uh, Steve? Uh, sure. Um, actually, one one thing that I, this is something I literally have just started, so I, don't, I have zero uh, data to back this up. Okay, so this is but really, we'll call that cutting edge. <laughs> cutting edge. I, I guess it's cutting edge. Um, and actually, um, I know some other people have done that with success, but I guess the big failing with my business and um, I've really been lately, because I've always been into 80-20, but I've really uh, actually sat mm. down and read book, that book by uh, Perry Marshall. Mm. I think it's like the 80-20 of sales and marketing, which is a really good book. Yeah. Um, I've really been thinking about, like he talks about not necessarily the 80-20, but figuring out what is the 80-20 of the 80-20 of the, mm. there's like, when he's really starts to drill down how your business is run, you really have to figure exactly like who, who are your best customers and how to actually find your best customers. And when I did an analysis on my business last week, I thought that, all, most of my email subscribers, and they, uh, you'll hear me talk a lot of email marketing because it really is the focal point of my business. All my email subscribers come from, not all, but I would say a substantial part comes from Kindle books. So these are people who've read my book in the past and they go on to join my email list. And the big failure with my business that I realized uh, from the last year or so is I've had the same lead magnet for all my books. So for at least for all my habit books, it's 77 Good Habits to Live a Better Life, which is, you know, it's an okay type of book, but it's not necessarily laser targeted to someone that buys, like, so say someone buys my Master Evernote book, they see the habits uh, free offer, so they might go on and enjoy my email list, but it's not necessarily directly applicable to what they're going through. And I've actually been working with a conversion optimizer. So some this is actually a type of uh, skill where something's in, looks at your funnel, figures out what you need to do to increase your opt-in rates, your sales rates, that sort of thing. And I think we, he quoted me around a 700 to $1,000 per book. But what he's going to kind of go uh, do is go in there and create a specialized offer, specialized type of email funnel for each individual book. So the Evernote book will have specific Evernote content. Mm. The declutter book that I'm coming out with have specialized declutter content, but it's it's really a highly uh, valuable piece of content that's directly applicable to that particular audience, um, potentially with some videos and that sort of thing. And odds are you'll convert a lot more people that are readers than you would, which is a regular kind of a uh, same old type of uh, uh, PDF that you have in every, inside of every single book. So uh, for the people starting out there, just have the first book or two, um, I would say it's definitely worth the time to kind of analyze the books that you have and perhaps create something specialized for each type of content. And without even running the numbers, I know for a fact that this is this is going to be a huge um, 
a huge increase in email opt-ins because I know myself, I know when I'm reading a blog post and they have what they call content upgrades mm. and you see something that's directly applicable to that blog post, invariably I'll always sign up for that email offer yeah. because I know that I know that it's something that can enhance whatever you're learning. Yeah. I, again, really good point. And uh, you mentioned uh, blog content upgrades and that's a, a tried and tested strategy and surprisingly few people do that, but the, I know that those that do get good results. And um, yeah. It's, you know, again, an important point here is that as you bring out, you know, new books, you've got more than one book, you only have to do this once for each book, set up a good piece of content that's specific to yeah. that book, and then and then it can run and run and run, and the autoresponder can send out the emails. And yes, you still want to do things to build a relationship once people are on the list, but that, that initial uh, p contact point and getting that initial email, uh, you know, say it, it doesn't have to be a lot of work. It might be a lot of work for you right now, Steve, because you're doing it for uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 books. But, uh, you know, certainly if you're starting out, it can be done on a rolling basis. And do you, I, I know you're sort of in the process of doing this, but do you have any numbers in terms of what your conversions were and what you what they are changing to or what you expect? See, this this gives hope for people listening because I've made a lot of mistakes. Up until a month ago or like two months ago, I never even tracked who was coming over from what books. And I finally sat down. Actually, I think that would be the first step you'd want to do if you have individual books is you want to put a link inside every book every single book that tracks specifically how many clicks are coming over in book one, how many clicks are coming from book two, book three, book four, so on and so forth. I didn't really do that up until a couple months ago. And I know that it's it's like everything else. It's like the 80-20, like the top couple mm -hmm. of books are the ones that drive the most um, clicks. And I know once they actually land on the general, um, that's the 77 Good Habits uh, page, the conversion rates are anywhere from 58 to 65%. So pretty decent, but I know just by looking at the reader numbers that I, I would say I would, I would sell anywhere from 400 to 600 uh, books a day and maybe 150, 200 people were clicking on the link. So the, the actual people reading my books and going over even clicking on the advertisements pretty, is pretty low. So I could see how well it could increase with the, with the right type of uh, uh, content. Okay, but it sounds like if you're getting that many people buying, you know, selling that many books a day and getting that many people clicking over and then 65, 50, 65 percent are, are signing up, um, that sounds like roughly a sort of 20 percent conversion rate, which is still solid. So if you can, I mean, that's a good starting point. If you can then improve on that, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, the highest, and I think this is exceptional, the highest rate that I think I've heard of was uh, a book, which was, uh, it was Mike Koenigs and Paul Colligan they were quite aggressive within that book in terms of offering bonus content uh, mm -hmm. that was specific to each chapter. And I think they ended up with something like a 36% opt-in rate. It might have been high. I think it was 36%. But uh, so they had a, a specific sort of call to action and offer at the end of every single chapter with stuff that was specific to that chapter. So they really, they hadn't just gone it on a per book basis, they gone <laughs> on a per chapter basis. So <laughs> uh, Yeah, I would say one thing for that is... Um, as far as I, I don't know too much about their actual business, but I do know that they tend to be people who have actual products and software to sell. So I would say as far as your, it's a different type of mindset. For me, I just want people to read more books, buy more books. They have higher ticket items. So I would say yeah. for everyone watching and listening, be very careful with this because Amazon readers are very, in general, ebook readers are very picky about having too much advertisements in their books. So you really want to find a delicate balance. Obviously, if you have a thousand dollar course that you want to promote and you don't mind a few negative reviews on your book, just as long as you're selling your thousand dollar course and by all means do stuff like that. But you don't, if you're trying to sell more books and build up a book catalog, don't, don't mm. weigh down your book with a bunch of advertisements and uh, yeah. uh, try try constantly try to pitch them full of stuff or pitch them with stuff. Yeah, uh, that is a good point. And yeah, you're right. People will leave bad reviews if there's too much of that. And the other thing that yeah. I would just like to add to what you just said is that um, you really don't want to do you know what we call a sort of bait and switch where uh, people start reading and then you have something at the end that says, if you want the rest of this, go here and, and yeah. uh, put your email in because that will guarantee you a lot of oh, negative yeah. reviews, a lot of refunds, that kind of stuff. What The way to do it is it's got to be genuine bonus content. So your book must deliver on whatever promise you make within the book and that's you know the promise that comes from the title the subtitle the description and so on uh, it must deliver on that the stuff that you give away for free has got to be genuinely bonus content which doesn't is is related uh you know it's got to be um as related to the book as you can make it but is not necessarily something that would fit as part of the book uh that will 
get you good results, but say don't do the bait and switch thing. <laughs> yeah, actually, I couldn't agree with you anymore. It's uh, definitely just it's supplementary material, um, but everything that's promised on the cover should be solved within within the confines of your book itself. And then if they decide to go check out your website and get extra stuff, they can, but it's not it's not absolutely necessary for the like the, the reading experience that you're giving them. Yeah. Good. And so what else have you got? I mean, I know you, you want to talk about email marketing at some point. Is there anything else you want to talk about um, that's that's working really well for you? Again, I suppose uh, sort of 80-20 principle, if you want to drill down 64-4 is the, is the next level, isn't it, if you drill down? This uh, this might work. It, again, if, if I sound vague, it's just because I'm constantly testing new stuff and I'm, I'm trying to find extra stuff beyond uh, what I'm currently doing. But kind of in line with the Facebook ads um, and actually content inside your book, what I'm also testing is a kind of remarketing pixel from Facebook. And there are other remarketing websites, but there, there's uh, I find Facebook's the easiest because people generally use Facebook the most. Mm -hmm. But uh, with Facebook ads, you can basically take a pixel, put it on top of your, now you have to have a content website, but put it on your website and inside your book, every time you have something that you want to explain further, if you happen to have a blog post, you can link to it. But if you provide enough links, and th again, this is kind of what we just talked about, supplementary material, not necessarily um, absolutely something that should be included in the book, but something just a little bit extra. You yeah. don't even need to necessarily send them to an opt-in page, just send them to your website. And through the retargeting pixel, you know that this is someone that read your book, clicked over your website. So they, and it, it, they're, with uh, remarketing, you have to actually put like a, it, like it's like a exclude include statement. So clicks this page, but is not on this page, which is the not on this page is uh, not on your email list. The whatever thank you page. It's kind of hard to describe just verbally, yeah. but basically it's just people that clicked over your website but haven't joined your email list. You can actually retarget them with a uh, PDF offer or an email list offer. So just kind of another way that you can also grow your email list. And these are kind of uh, warm leads because they've already read your mm -hmm. Kindle book. Hopefully yeah. they can go on to join your email list. Yeah, and I think that's good. I mean, I know Ryan Dice has been doing something sort of similar where you know you get people into a piece of content and get them, as you say, warmed up. Uh, before even asking for the email list, and then you you advertise through Facebook and get them onto it, or through some kind of retargeting, and then you get them onto an opt-in page at a later point in time. And, yeah, uh, it's 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 hard because it's the margins aren't quite there. Um, and actually, what I've what the kind of realization I came to is, if you're trying to do it, if you're trying to sell like a ninety-nine cent book or two ninety-nine book or something like that you won't really get a return on your money. But if you take your books and put them into a bundle, and I think that's kind of what Mark Dawson is doing, uh, what he's what he's kind of helping people with, is just you actually have an actual bundle offer. So they, you know they read one book and present them with a nine ninety nine bundle of six or seven of your books. And that's, that's something I'm going to try in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. But something along those lines, a little bit of a higher uh, price value that you can actually pay for advertisement and not lose your shirt in the process. Yeah. And uh, yeah, with, with that Ryan Dice example I gave, you know, something that, that I should mention there is that Ryan and his team are selling sort of more expensive products, not yeah. uh, not books in in, the, in this case. So obviously the margins for those uh, courses they're selling are a lot more than uh, on a $5 or a $10 Kindle book, which means they've got a bit more scope to uh, pay for the advertising. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'd, actually, I think from the Ryan Dice example, they use what's called a tripwire. And I think that's a... Uh, seven dollar product that just kind of gets people into door pays for the advertisement themselves they know that they they actually have paid for the advertisement so they basically got a lead for free and then they have them join the email list and pre present them future offers but you could you could kind of take the same model just by putting everything into a bundle mm -hmm. consider that your quote unquote tripwire and hopefully they'll go on to join your email list and you can present them with future book offers yeah and it's interesting it'd be really interesting to if you share results at a, you know some point in the future because you know you've got that initial sale hopefully which well, hopefully the advertising will pay for itself and then the next consideration is going to be you know what's the lifetime value of that customer if you're bringing up multiple books and of course yeah. you've got a, a big catalog of books which means you've, you've got a lot of potential there to cross sell other books and if you ever decide to bring out uh, course material which is related to the books those people are interested in that's another thing that, uh, that people can be upsell so yeah always be thinking as well about not just the initial sale but the long-term uh, value of that customer yeah, it's it is hard because um, I'm really into kind of like data and uh, knowing my numbers. And Amazon, as as pretty much everyone knows, it's just they're really <laughs> secretive about their numbers. You don't you don't even know how many people landed on your page or even looked at your book. You just see your sales number. So it's really hard sometimes to actually run a bunch of tests and really know what's absolutely 100% working for your business. 
Yeah, it is something I, I'd like to mention. I, mean, I don't know if you use, uh, or so I start, I'll start that again. I don't know what you use. I use lead pages a lot for um, mm -hmm. the for landing pages, and I use Get Response. But there's lots of different email service providers. Um, so you can the Facebook tracking pixels we're talking about. I mean, uh, to go into Facebook tracking pixels into depth is beyond the scope of this <laughs> yeah. presentation. But there are plenty of people that do teach it. So if you want to find out more, that's not going to be a difficult thing for you to do. But you can put Facebook tra tracking pixels onto uh, you know your lead pages opt-in pages. So you don't even have to have a website now to be able to do that. You can just create, uh, use the templates on lead pages, create a very quick opt-in page, add the code there, and there's a little box. It's very, very straightforward. Just copy and paste it in. That's all you need to do. So you can track and, and do the Facebook uh, uh, retargeting through that. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I was going to say something else. I forgot what it was. <laughs> I, I would actually, I would say one thing. I'm not 100 sure about this, but I actually read somewhere that Facebook is starting to crack down on lead pages specifically, and that's kind of what I use as well. So, I would say you would need a website, but with lead pages, if um, this is really kind of into the weeds here, but if you do use lead pages, they have a simple plugin where you can just install onto your blog into a WordPress blog. And you actually just find a lead page, so it actually people come to your site, they see it's your URL, not necessarily lead pages URL. I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but I've heard that Facebook, Facebook's like Google, where they're just they they change the yeah. rule pretty much on a daily basis. So I would definitely check out their terms. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, say that's what I've been doing, and yeah, I've got the plugin as well. So I'll keep an eye on that space because actually that's the first time I've heard about that. But yeah, I mean, Facebook is a lot like Google. <laughs> it's change every couple of minutes. So. Okay, so that's interesting, and um, so yeah, uh, and what uh, what else? What's what's something which is maybe um, I'm just trying to think. What's something which is perhaps not necessarily a new thing that you're doing, but something which is getting you big results? I would say sales events. Um, I've just I started doing that in the fall, and I really kind of been like tweaking that and and kind of improving the process, but. Uh, I guess the one major problem that people have, so they'll say that you come out with a book in March and you come out yeah. with a book in May. There's that month lag where like they're just your sales are dropping and you're like, all right, what do I do now? I find that just by holding regular sales events, um, taking four or five books, dropping them down to a low nine nine cents, a uh, dollar nine nine or whatnot, like just a, definitely a dis a heavily discount it and run an actual theme around the sales event. So instead of just saying, Hey, I've got my one book on countdown deal today. Here are five books are all at 99 cents and just create an actual event around that. And, um, I, I did that in the fall. I did a fall sales event. I did a cyber Monday sales event and I did a St. Patrick's day event. I'm actually gearing up for a spring event in a couple of weeks and just, I just run, I run, um, uh, my, well, I run ads to it. Obviously, uh, now that I have a couple of Facebook pages that are slightly built up, I'll run ads to that as well. Um, I email to my list a couple of times. I, uh, I try to actually uh, connections. I have to actually have um, free book book promotion sites like uh, BuckBooks.net. I know that they'll, if I give them enough advance warning, they'll at least promote a book or two. So I try to create as much buzz around a sales event like I would with any sort of book launch. And just, I just find that week during that week, a lot of I, I move a lot of books, and even when you're selling a book at nine and ten, um, they'll invariably they'll go and join your email list, and potentially they could go out and buy more books, and it does kind of help uh, build on itself. So, yeah, um, I find it's like like kind of like a book launch where you don't necessarily want to do all the promotion in one day. You want to hit one area for like you want to hit your email list on a Monday. You want to post something on Facebook on a Tuesday. You want to post something on another Facebook group on Wednesday, another email on Thursday. So you want to have an actual time sequence where you're constantly pushing people to the pages. So it just, it seemed like you get that kind of stickiness that Amazon mm -hmm. seems to like, but as far as letting them promote the book on their end. But yeah. I find that that's kind of something that's uh, a nice little way to um, build buzz around my book. So I'm not necessarily about to launch a new one. Mm. Okay, so that, that that leads me to a question in that case because there are different ways that you can, you know, boost sales in, when you're doing this kind of promotion. One thing is you could drop the book price down to ninety nine cents. Uh, you could also do a Kindle countdown where you can drop the book price down and uh, and have that little countdown timer. You know, something else that you can also do. You're not going to get paid for it, but you can drop the book for free if it's part of KDP Select. So, with those three options. Uh, do you use all of them, or do you find that there's one that works particularly well for you, one that doesn't work well for you? What do you choose to do? I try to do all of them, but mostly is the Kindle Countdown deal. And 
uh, for everyone watching. The, the biggest drawback to the Kindle Countdown deal is it's only available in the United States and the United Kingdom, which really, in my opinion, that kind of sucks because you're, you're, you're not giving the full experience to all your entire audience. So I had to be really careful with my marketing for this. So when I'm emailing my list, I make sure I only target to people from the United States and the United Kingdom. And for mm -hmm. some reason, someone happens to not live there. Um, I asked them to personally email me, and sometimes I'll just give them the book for free. Just don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I'll, I'll try. I'll try to be as helpful, or I'll say just um, you know, there's if you want five books, just you know, send me five bucks through PayPal or something like that. At least try to try to make sure that they're paying as much as the other people would in the United States, and the United Kingdom. But so I tend to use Kindle countdown deals. I just wish that Amazon would actually. Per, provide it for all the different websites, not necessarily yeah. just the two countries. I think um, they are I, sort of. Uh, sorry, sorry just say, I think they are sort of going to be gradually rolling it out to other countries, aren't they? But they've been adding, they've added so many new country specific yeah. websites that uh, there's, there's, uh, they're always kind of behind that curve. Yeah, at least at least Australia and Canada or uh, and Brazil too. Those are like the three other markets that seem to do pretty well. So at least those countries. But uh, yeah, it, it kind of stinks. But um, yeah, I would say beyond that, I do once in a while I'll, I'll put a book for free. So a book I know that doesn't sell that well, sometimes I'll just put that for free. Like um, example at the top of my head is the Ten Thousand Steps Blueprint. That's my kind of walking habit book that just traditionally doesn't do that well up until actually this time of year, springtime, it seems to do pretty well. But um, otherwise, I'll just I'll put that for free. And, and it, I'm actually starting to move a couple books out of KDP Select. And uh, moving forward, if if I do that and I'm promoting those books, I'll just drop them manually to ninety nine cents. But I guess the only drawback to that is you get thirty five percent royalty rate, not the seventy percent royalty rate like you would with a uh, Kindle Countdown deal. Yeah, and something that perhaps we should touch on. I think we've mentioned this specifically uh, to this point is that your books. Uh, you know, write the books that you've been writing recently, you, I suppose you did mention this, they're all within the sort of habit, self-improvement sort of yeah. area. So, I mean, that's a key thing. You know, if, if you're listening to this and you're thinking about putting together a portfolio of books, you probably want them to be reasonably closely related so that somebody who buys one book is, is going to be interested in your other books rather than doing, you know, what I've seen some people do, which is jump around and be <laughs> chasing, just be chasing the what they think is a good market and then they're ending up with lots of different books in different categories and really zero chance of cross promoting them. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually, um, I would, we, we, we're kind of more talking about advanced stuff in, in this uh, conversation, but yeah, that's one of the, like the basic fundamental rules that I tell people is just pick one niche, almost like you would with a blog is just pick one niche and just make it the point of you're going to take this niche and every book is really diving down to one kind of subtopic of that niche. And I find that when someone really likes my, my content, they'll go on, they'll actually go on and buy 10 of my books. So that's the kind of customers that you're trying to build. You're buying, you're not necessarily trying to get someone to buy one book. You're trying to get someone that finds your content engaging and will go on to buy your entire catalog. And I guess all these strategies I'm talking about, really that's long-term goals. I'm just, I'm just trying to get people in the door that might be interested in whatever I have to offer and just, um, I don't mind losing money actually on the first or second interaction, just as long as I know I'm kind of building lifetime customers. Yeah. And so, you know, in terms of getting those customers in the first place, obviously there are things you do to get people through Amazon. You've also got a blog, you've also got a podcast. How are you finding those as ways of generating <laughs> traffic and getting people onto your books? Yeah, not the best. I, I actually find that SlideShare is my, my second uh, driver of, of email marketing. Or, sorry, uh, that's the second driver of uh, email opt-ins. So that does pretty well. I'm not, they don't really seem to convert as well as uh, Kindle book uh, buyers. And I know the blog, they, I do get some subscribers from that. So I, I guess I'll just go back to kind of 80-20 rule. It's just I find that, yes, I get about 20% of my email subscribers from these places, but they just don't seem to convert as well because it's I'm basically adding another extra step or two. So not only do they join my list, I have to convince them that they even want to read Kindle content. And then I have to convince them from wanting to read Kindle content that they have to read my Kindle content. It's like I just like have to teach them a couple extra steps, which is uh not always easiest to do. Whereas if you get someone that reads a book, they're are they're already kind of self selecting. And I guess the uh, book I mentioned before with Perry Marshall with the eighty twenty rule, he he has a term that he a term he talks about called um, racking the shotgun uh, where to, like basically um, he uses a story about basically like uh, making a shotgun sound and whoever looks up that those are the people you sh that shouldn't be part of your market. I'm probably butchering the story, but the point is <laughs> you, you want to actually go out and, uh, and market to the people who have already self-selected themselves, not try to teach them a whole new thing. So 
I know that people on Amazon are already reading Kindle books, so I don't have to teach them the value of reading the Kindle books. I just have to find the right people on Amazon who want to read my book. So um, I guess as far as all these other strategies, I've really, I've tested a lot. I just haven't found that they convert anywhere near as well as, uh, as uh, the readers on Amazon. Okay. And so, I mean, that's, that's really good to know. With the email stuff, I mean, perhaps we we'll dig into the email marketing a bit more now, is what sort of things are you doing to build those relationships and get the people, particularly those that come through Amazon through buying it, one of your other books, get them back into your, uh, well, back onto Amazon and back onto buying your next book? Yeah, it's sad, sad to say up until a month ago, I really didn't do much with my autoresponder sequence. I had a, um, I had a couple emails, but I wasn't really doing a good job of really promoting all my books. Uh, so what I would do is I would basically get them on my list. I'd have a couple of emails. And then every time I had a book launch, I would just email them with uh, details about the book launch. And that did pretty well. But pretty much like every market, Amazon's uh, growing. There's more competition. It's just going to be harder to compete. So I've actually sat down and created a, um, right now it's at, eight parts, I think. I have an eight-part autoresponder sequence, and that's just basically your welcome email. Um, I try to get them to join the Facebook page, which I talked about before, just the idea of kind of multiple touch points. I have a second email that's uh, really kind of personalized and engaging. It's it's uh, called How How Habits Have Saved My Life, and it's a kind of a true story about what I went through over a decade about my kind of uh, love for habit development, personal development in general. Um, so there's that's a second email, and then from there, I start to go into my Kindle book. So uh, the, the third email is just a free um, a free perma free book that I have on Amazon. So go check out this free book I have on Amazon. It's called Bad Habits No More. Just a uh, link to that. And then I start um, promoting individual uh, books. So I have an email about my procrastination habits book. I have an email about my master Evernote. And I'm really, I'm really going to actually sit down and create a book bundle. And probably when I have that book bundle together, I'm probably going to move that up into like the fourth or fifth spot. But I guess the point here is I'm trying to get people not only kind of engage with me on Facebook, check out free content, but also check out uh, the different books I have to offer. And actually inside uh, some of those books, I'm uh, sorry, some of those emails themselves, I have a link to the Audible version where Audible has a special deal where if you go download the book for free, the, if, you, if you sign up for Audible and buy one of your books for free, the author gets actually a $50 bounty. So mm. I'm trying to I'm trying to get people to go check out my audiobook content. And, I, l I like podcasts. I haven't really quite gotten into audiobooks, but I do know there is a whole market there for people who absolutely love audiobook content. So I'm trying to engage those people as well and also help people who maybe just write, read Kindle books, but maybe they might be interested in audiobooks. So I'm, I'm trying, it's, it's hard because I have so much content out there. I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to pare it down without hating them with a thousand different offers. So yeah, I guess at the, I guess at the end of the day is I'm going to put a couple of emails, see which ones convert the best and just, delete the ones that don't convert well and maybe move another email into its place. So it's, it's kind of like everything else I do. I'm just constantly testing and moving things around. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that strikes me is that with the, the podcasting, obviously people are listening to that typically on the go. Most people are, you know, they're driving or they're at the gym or doing something. So that's going to be a great market for audiobooks because it's the same yeah. way of consuming content. So, you know, if you were to get people from your you know, those that do opt in via the podcast, get them onto a, a separate list. And, and I'm not saying this to you specifically, Sam, I'm saying this to everybody, <laughs> is get those people onto a separate list and then send them a separate autoresponder series, which focuses much more on the audiobooks. And that uh, that $50 oh, yeah. you, you mentioned is because, you know, typically people will spend more on an audiobook than a, a Kindle book anyway. So uh, even if the percentages of royalties you get is lower, the overall amount is typically higher. But as you say, if, the, if somebody signs up for Audible and it's the and you, you're you the person that's introduced them, you get that $50 bonus. And I know a lot of people who are doing very, very well because it's still relatively early days for audiobooks. You know, it's, it's by no means is the market saturated. So there's a lot of people picking up audiobooks for the first time. So it's quite a sweet deal. You can offer somebody a free audiobook and you get paid, you know, $50 or $15 <laughs> or whatever the, the amount is. Um, that's That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I find that audiobooks have done pretty well, but it's uh, nowhere near the, the Kindle market. But I don't know, maybe maybe three, four years down the road, it will it will equal that. And I do have a friend who sells as many print books as Kindle books as audiobooks. Like his his business is almost in a third of each. So mm -hmm. it, it really depends on your markets. There's some markets they just prefer audio content, and um, I just happen to be in a market that prefers Kindle content. But you never know until you until you put yourself out there in multiple versions. Yeah. And um, 
what, you know, what, what else have we, you know, what else have you got? I say, I'm going to, I'm just kind of <laughs> at your mercy a little bit with this presentation because uh, um, whatever you want to share with us. I'm, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, actually, the autoresponder sequence, that one really um, was an eye opener. And I would say, uh, like everything, you definitely want to track your, um, you want to track your conversions. And what I do through that is, or let me start by saying this is technically not allowed, but I do it anyway. Um, <laughs> through, through the Amazon Associates program, you can create affiliate links. And I figured my, my excuse is I'm just promoting my book, so I'm not really trying to skirt around trying to manipulate their system. But I like to put in individual affiliate links within my um, within my actual email campaign so I know that sales are coming from this email, sales are coming from that email. And I really I really think that the really important aspect of your business want to know actually having that this particular email is doing well you want to start actually ranking according to how well the emails are doing so obviously the emails that are really engaging and gets people to know you on, on a personal level put those in front the mm -hmm. emails that convert the best put those right after that and then just like in order um, put put them um, kind of like the best to the worst but then try also keep your sequence short to I, I like I usually recommend anywhere from an email sequence of three to four weeks and once someone's passed the actual uh, autoresponder sequence and I just put them in, in the actual broadcast sequence so every uh, for people that might not know what that is but a broadcast is just simply those are emails that you send out to the people on a certain day and everyone um, everyone on your list or you can actually uh, segment your list so everyone who's already gone through the autoresponder sequence gets a, a broadcast sequence and yeah uh, that's that's typically what I like to do when I email people I like to let them complete the autoresponder sequence before I start um, promoting them with new stuff okay and uh, just explain because this is not something I'm not familiar with is with the Amazon Associates program and putting in the affiliate links how is it how are you able to track those links sure um, with Amazon Associates, you're actually given, I think it's upwards of 500 different uh, unique, unique URLs. Say that three times fast. Unique <laughs> URLs. Um, you can do that up, up to 500 times. So I'll really just, every time I create an email, I'll actually, or pretty much any time I create any sort of advertisement, I'll create a specialized URL. And I, I really like to follow a very um, strict kind of naming convention. So for instance, something that's in my autoresponder sequence, the actual name for the link will be DGH Auto 23 APH. And let me kind of explain that. So DGH Develop Good Habits. So I know that when I'm looking at my, my Amazon Associates, so those are links from my Develop Good Habits brand. Auto is just autoresponder. And 23 APH is kind of the short code for my 23 anti-procrastination habits. So you put that together. I know just by looking at a glance that uh, th these are autoresponder messages and I'll have like DGH FB page and then 23 APH. So mm -hmm. I know that links that come from my Facebook page to uh, uh, 23 anti-procrastination habits, I know that that created that may sell. So when you actually do it enough, you, you can start to um, get like, you can start to really kind of drill down and figure out exactly what uh, sales are being done. Actually, let me give you link real quick. I'm trying. That's it. Yeah. Uh, if you, if everyone goes to stevescottsite.com forward slash book dash marketing, I actually go through the process of uh, how to actually create these links and it actually has uh, little pretty pictures and stuff. Okay, so. that's really helpful. And so basically, once you go into your Amazon Associates dashboard, you'll be able to see which, it will actually show you within there which links people have come in through and what, you know, what they've converted. Yeah, and it, yeah. I actually really, it, you do generate a little bit of uh, affiliate income by doing it, but for me, I don't even really care about the affiliate income. It's more important that I just have that data there, and that's kind of what we talked about before with Amazon. You, know, you don't really know what books are being sold, like how many books are being sold by Amazon, how many books are being sold by you, so this is kind of my workaround as far as figuring out how to actually uh, get a lot of good metrics with your um with the items that you're selling. And I think that's really like kind of what we touched on before. I think that's really important for the kind of the growth of your business is really drilling down, figuring what's your 80, 20 and just focusing on those activities. Yeah. And uh, I'm just uh, keeping an eye on the clock here. So we've got a, just a few more minutes left. Um, anything else you want to bring up? Anything that we haven't sure. talked about? Um, I guess one thing, this is kind of away from actually book sales, but it, in a way, actually, I feel this helps my businesses um, kind of grow, is uh, translations. I've actually really um, tried to take a lot of my book content and put it into different languages, but 
I think the key that, or at least the, the 10,000 mistakes I've made is not necessarily trying to go out and try publishing a book in all these different languages. So say you have one book, instead of trying to publish that in 10 different languages, I think it almost makes sense to do it um, one language at a time. So for instance, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm focusing in on German and uh, Brazilian Portuguese. So uh, Portuguese, but sold in the Brazil market. Um, so there's just those two book lines and I'm just trying to basically replicate what I've done in the English language. So I actually have a translated version of my lead magnet, a translate, I actually have an email, a specialized email list for, for each one of those languages where people join my email list and actually get emails in German or email in Portuguese. And really all I did is just, I, I just found someone who speaks the language, uh, native, a native uh, language speaker of German, native language speaker of uh, a Portuguese. And I found the editor to kind of go over the content, just make sure it's top notch. And I just replicate that. And I, I struck a 50, 50 agreement with these persons. So, um, with these people. So they actually have a little bit of skin in the game. So not only will they translate the book, but every time I send an email, just say, Hey, can you translate this? And I'll just send it to the email list. They'll actually, they'll have an actual desire to actually go out and do that instead of, uh, I'm just someone that, that, that pays them occasionally. So, and uh, I find another valuable uh, way that they help out is every time of a book, they can go out and get a few reviews for the book as well. So it's yeah. just, it's, it's like working with another author, another author who all they have to really do is just translate the language, but they, they can actually generate passive income on their end just by helping promote your book. So it's, um, it's really, a, for me, it's been a way to kind of uh, start getting a little bit of extra income. And I've seen a couple months where I sold a couple thousand dollars worth of translated books. So it, it has some legs to it. I'm just still trying to figure it out right now, but I yeah. think honestly, that, that's what it all of your books. Are you just rolling through your, your catalog? I'm just, I'm focusing on the habit books and I'm kind of 80, 20. And so I'm trying to figure out the habit books that sell the best in the English language and focus on those first for those two languages. But I think once I have a system down, I'll, I, I might actually hire a full-time person, not full-time, but at least a part-time person to kind of handle that aspect of my business, just because it's a little bit um, overwhelming trying to deal with multiple languages, <laughs> multiple yeah. books, and it, it gets <laughs> too much sometimes. Yeah. But uh, nice if you can do that. I mean, if you could be bringing in, uh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars or more and hopefully growing that over time as you, as you bring out more books and perhaps roll into, I guess I'm thinking Spanish is probably a good choice because you've got Spanish yeah. speakers in the U S you've got, uh, Amazon, Mexico, you've got Amazon, Spain. So there's straight over, there's three different. And then, you know, uh, anybody buying from non-Portuguese speaking South American countries, uh, you know, so there's a, a, a lot of potential there as well. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I could definitely see how this is going to grow. And I, I think Robert Kiyosaki, that guy's like, he he's in a way um, something I kind of like. I watch how he comes out with books. He seems to come out book every year. And when a book comes out, he actually said this in some sort of interview or wrote it in his book. But every time it comes out with a book, he has 30 different languages almost instantly published elsewhere. So he has this whole like web of content that he just puts out there. And it, mm -hmm. he seems he seems to be doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, he seems to be doing okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, any, anything else? We got maybe time for one more one more tip before we wrap one things up. More. Um, I would, I guess, finally, honestly, is uh, Street Team. That that one's been um, lately been a really important part of my business because when you come out with uh, you know a ton of books like I do, it gets yeah. hard to t tap the same person to leave reviews again and again and again. So I'm, I'm actually really kind of earnestly building my street team. And that's just simply people have read your content in the past. Uh, you ask them to join your street team and just say, say every time you come out with a new book, if they wouldn't mind leaving a review. And I try to keep it very casually, um, very casual as far as um, the, the interaction, the relationship. I'm not telling them they have to join my team and they have to leave reviews in order to stay a member of the team. It's it's more like if you don't mind, just leave a review. And um, I just do that on a, on a one by one basis. So every, anytime someone emails me, sorry, excuse me. Um, I just reply back. I try to help them with whatever question they have. And then I say, Hey, if you, since you like, you said, Oh, I liked a uh, master Evernote. I really liked uh, exercise every day or something like that. I'll say, Hey, would you mind going leave a review? And I'll actually take the link to the book. The actual, if you look on Amazon, there's a write a review up uh, uh, little button I actually mm. take that link. So very specific. All they do is click the link and then just leave a review. It's like, I try to make it as painless as possible. And yeah. I actually will end the email just by saying, hey, like even just writing what you just wrote, just copying and pasting what you just wrote, putting that in Amazon, um, that would really help. And if they reply back and they do that, that shows that they're actually someone who will leave a review. And then I try to uh, like approach them as far as joining the street team. So that's actually kind of in the background. Sorry, trying to build that up. I didn't catch that's, the name. Oh, a street team? Street team. 
yeah, it's it's a it's basically a fiction concept. I know a lot of okay. fiction authors they'll 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 actually have their quote unquote street team of people who like their books and will go out and leave reviews every time they come out with a new one. And just I'm trying to take that idea and just put it into the nonfiction space. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, very good. So we got lots. We covered lots and lots of stuff. Really, really good tips there, Steve. What? Where can people go to follow up with you? Find out more. Uh, you know, you've got an Amazon author page, obviously, uh, websites, blog, podcasts. So, <laughs> where where can people go? Uh, of course, I'm going to want to promote my Kindle book. So, I guess start if you're interested in my Kindle books, just go to habitbooks.com. And if you're interested more in self publishing stuff, I have self publishing questions, which is on iTunes and Stitcher. Just type in self-publishing questions, you can find my uh, content there. So I would say those are two brands I'm currently really working on building up over this year or two. Good, fantastic. So great, Steve. Uh, big, big thank you for coming on, being part of the Self-Publishing Summit. Always good to talk to you. And yep. thank you again for sharing such great content. And you know what I think is great, just to, just to reiterate this, is that You've you've been very honest with it and said you know that these are things that I haven't been doing that I should be doing these are things I've just started yeah. doing you've had enormous success obviously you've created masses of content you've got fifty books out but uh, you know you've been succeeding for a long time this is not like something that has just begun so I think if you can have that level of success without doing some of these things uh, obviously yeah. you're going to go on to even bigger and greater things so I'm looking forward to, uh, you know in the future to to hearing more about your success so. Uh, and again, that that takeaway point I mentioned earlier, which is you know always be trying new things, always be testing. So, Steve, thank you very much for coming on, being part of the summit. Well, thanks, John, and thanks everyone for watching slash listening. Cheers, Steve. Bye. -bye.